It had been 80 years since slavery had ended in America. Yet fear and suspicion had kept America a society segregated by race. It had been 50 years since the Supreme Court upheld the doctrine of separate but equal in Plessy versus Ferguson. However, in reality, separate was anything but equal. During World War II, more and more African Americans began to strive for equal rights. Black workers demanded equal opportunity in defense jobs. After the war, African American veterans who had enjoyed equal treatment in European society were not willing to be treated as second class citizens in their own country. Membership in the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, swelled from 50,000 to 450,000. President Harry Truman recognized the courageous efforts of black troops in World War II by integrating the armed forces. One of the first breakthroughs in desegregation was on the ball field. The Brooklyn Dodgers started the 1947 season with a second baseman named Jackie Robinson the first black man to join the previously all-white rosters of Major League Baseball. The wall of segregation had begun to crack. Spurred on by these victories, the civil rights movement continued to grow. In 1954, Thurgood Marshall won a groundbreaking decision in Brown versus Board of Education, which overturned the separate but equal standard from Plessy versus Ferguson. The unanimous opinion offered by Chief Justice Earl Warren call for integration of the nation's public schools with all deliberate speed. But the leaders of the movement knew they needed political as well as legal victories in order to fully advance their case. Joanne Robinson, an English professor who had been forced to take a back seat on a bus in 1949, was preparing a plan for a citywide bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama. So when a seamstress named Rosa Parks was arrested on December 1st, 1955, for refusing to surrender her seat to a white person, Joanne Robinson was ready. She organized a year-long boycott of city buses. Finally, the Montgomery city officials relented and integrated the buses. Out of this boycott arose a major leader in the civil rights movement, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a young preacher from Atlanta who had studied Mahatma Gandhi's principles of nonviolent civil disobedience. Fine, dignified, disciplined, courageous seamstress from this community was sitting down on a bus on the 1st of December. The bus driver told her to get up and move to the back and stand in order that a boarding male white passage could take her seat. Sister Rose of Parks, with dignity and discipline, said in substance that the cup of endurance has run over. I can take it no longer. With Martin Luther back in the 16th century, who said, after nailing the 95 theses on the door to the church at Wittenberg, here I stand and I can do none other, so help me God. It was Rosa Parks who on the 1st of December said, here I sit and I can do none other, so help me God. Peggy Terry was a poor white woman in Montgomery, Alabama, whose life was profoundly changed by the Montgomery bus boycott. In Paducah, Kentucky, we lived on the edge. We could sit on the porch and hear the singing from the black church. I never made friends with any of them because I was brought up in prejudice. You pick it up. It's like the air you breathe. There wasn't anyone saying any different until I heard Reverend King. I never heard any black person say, I'm as good as you are, out in the open. As long as you can say, I'm better than they are, then there is somebody below you can kick. But once you get over that, you see that you're not any better off than they are. In fact, you're worse off because you're living a lie. 
and it was right there in front of us in the cotton field, chopping cotton, and right over in the next field, there's these black people. Alabama, Texas, Kentucky, never once did it occur to me that we had anything in common. I was living in Montgomery, Alabama during the bus boycott, and that absolutely changed my life. It forced white people to take a look at the situation. Not all of them changed the way I did. It didn't leave you in the same comfortable spot you were in. You had to be either for it or against it. When I heard that Martin Luther King was going to get out of jail, me and some other white women wanted to see this smart aleck. I'm so thankful I went down there that day because I might have gone my whole life just the way I was. When I saw all those people beating up on him, and he didn't fight back and didn't cuss like I would have done, and he didn't say anything, I, I was just turned upside down. With all my feelings and what had happened in Montgomery, I was ready to take a step forward and try to undo all the damage. When I believe in something, I act on it. I went down and joined the Congress for Racial Equality. Cool. I enjoy picketing too. I don't remember who we were picketing, but this really well-dressed white woman said, why are you out here doing this? <laughs> I had about six kids with me, mine and my girlfriends. I said, well, where else could I go and be treated with this respect that I've been treated with by Reverend King, the Nobel Peace Prize winner? No white Nobel Prize winner would pay poor white trash like me the slightest attention. Reverend King does. In the spring of 1957, leaders of the NAACP sought to begin the process of school integration. It had been three years since the Supreme Court's historic Brown v. Board of Education decision. Many people had been justifiably afraid to attempt to carry out the order of the court. They knew it meant putting their lives in danger. The local chapter of the NAACP in Little Rock, Arkansas, asked black students to volunteer to attend all-white Central High School. In the spring, many students volunteered, but by the fall, that number had dropped to nine. Throughout the summer, tensions rose because many people were afraid of black and white students going to school together. Finally, when the students arrived for their first day of school on September 4th, 1957, they were met by the rifles of the Arkansas National Guard. The guard had been called in by Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus to prevent nine black teenagers from attending an all-white public high school. The governor had deliberately disregarded a ruling by the Supreme Court of the United States, setting up a constitutional showdown with the federal government. President Eisenhower was forced to respond. Eisenhower placed the Arkansas National Guard under federal authority and called in the 101st Airborne Division to guarantee the safety of the nine courageous the students. Office in the White House in Washington, D.C., the President of the United States, Dwight D. Eisenhower. I have today issued an executive order directing the use of troops under federal authority to aid in the execution of federal law at Little Rock, Arkansas. The responsibility and authority of the Supreme Court to interpret the Constitution are very clear. Mob rule can not be allowed to override the decisions of our courts. We are a nation in which laws, not men, are supreme. With all deliberate speed, integration spread throughout the South, from primary and secondary schools to colleges and universities, sometimes quietly, but all too often with dramatic confrontations. In the summer of 1960, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, was created by a group of young people who were growing impatient with the movement. They were committed to nonviolence, but they were eager to confront the segregationists at every turn. SNCC organized voter education classes to help get blacks registered to vote. They also understood the importance of television. The SNCC volunteers conducted sit-ins at lunch counters throughout the South. In many cases, they tipped off the media to make sure the cameras would be there to capture the event. The nation watched in horror as these young black people were brutally beaten and then arrested by the police for causing a disturbance. In 1962, Corps sponsored a group of young people to ride buses throughout the South, confronting segregationist rules in every state they traveled. 
The Freedom Riders, as they became known, were generally greeted with tension and resentment until they reached Mississippi and Alabama, where the tension turned into violent attacks. As more and more African Americans began demanding their right to vote, certain places were not going to give in without putting up a fight. In Birmingham, Alabama, Sheriff Bull Connor was determined to stop the voter registration drives. Fires of frustration and discord are burning in every city, where legal remedies are not at hand. Redress is sought in the streets, in demonstrations, parades, and protests, which create tension and threaten violence and threaten lives. Television cameras sent pictures of tear gas protesters and police beatings to viewers around the nation. In the summer of 1963, Martin Luther King led the historic March on Washington. More than 250,000 people came from all over the country to support civil rights legislation. The White House and Congress took notice. In the autumn of 1963, President John F. Kennedy had civil rights legislation introduced in Congress. After the assassination of President Kennedy, President Lyndon Johnson put the passage of the civil rights bill at the top of his political agenda. And we shall overcome. With support growing behind the passage of the civil rights bill, the tension grew dramatically throughout the South. Students from the North were coming down to help register black voters. In the early summer of 1964, three young men disappeared after being arrested and released by the police in Philadelphia, Mississippi. The disappearance of James Cheney, Michael Schwerner, and Andrew Goodman captured the nation's attention. Even President Johnson paid very close attention to the case. The search went on for several weeks. Then in June, the FBI found their abandoned car. That sheriff's a pretty bad fellow down there, isn't he? Yes, he is, and we've been, uh, been going over him pretty thoroughly. Mm -hmm. uh, there are several theories that have been advanced, and uh, of course we're running out all leads, some of them are cranks, but we are running out all of them. One is that this may have been done by these three fellows uh, as in order to create an incident that would uh, inflame the situation. Uh, the basis for that is that uh, the uh, setting this car fire within the sight of the highway, it was only a few feet off the highway, and, bur and burning it, leaving the license tags on the car, was not a thing a person would do who probably had committed a murder and had killed the three. A paid informant led the FBI to where the bodies were buried. Sheriff Price and his fellow Klansmen were charged with a civil rights violation and tried in a federal court because the state of Mississippi refused to charge them with murder. Mississippi was also the home of Fannie Lou Hamer. Fannie Lou Hamer was born in 1917. Like her parents, she was a sharecropper on a plantation most of her life. I married in 1944, stayed on the plantation until 1962, when I went down to the courthouse in Indianola to register to vote. That happened because I went to a mass meeting one night. Until then, I'd never heard of no mass meeting, and I didn't know that a Negro could register and vote. When they asked for those to raise their hands who'd go down to the courthouse the next day, I raised mine, had it as high as I could get it. I guess if I'd had it as since, I'd been a little scared. But what was the point of being scared? The only thing they could do to me was kill me. And it seemed like they'd been trying to do that a little bit at a time ever since I could remember. I reckon the most horrible experience I've had was June 1963. I was arrested along with several others in Winona, Mississippi. The state highway patrolman came and carried me out of the cell into another cell where there were two Negro prisoners. Patrolman gave the first Negro a long blackjack that was heavy. It was loaded with something, and they had to lay me down on the bunk with my face down, and I was beat. I was beat by the first Negro till he gave out. Then the patrolman ordered the other man to take the blackjack, and he began to beat. That's when I, I started screaming and working my feet, because I couldn't help it. 
The patrolman told the first Negro that had to beat me to sit on my feet. I had to hug around the mattress to keep the sound from coming out. Finally, they carried me back to my cell. Fannie Lou Hamer was eventually released from jail, and she continued her voter registration work. President Johnson, using every bit of his vast influence, was able to get the Civil Rights Bill passed. Fannie Lou Hamer's voter registration drive was a tremendous success story. In 1964, we registered 63,000 black people from Mississippi into the Freedom Democratic Party. We formed our own party because the whites wouldn't even let us register. We decided to challenge the white Mississippi Democratic Party at the National Convention. We followed all the laws that the white people themselves made. We tried to attend the precinct meeting, and they locked the doors on us or moved the meetings, and that's against the law they made for their own selves. So we were the ones that held the real precinct meetings. At all these meetings across the state, we elected our representatives to go to the National Democratic Convention in Atlantic City. But we learned the hard way that even though we had all the law and all the righteousness on our side, that the white man is not going to give up his power to us. President Johnson's vice presidential running mate, Hubert Humphrey, brokered a deal allowing only two of the Freedom Democratic Party delegates to join the Mississippi delegation on the convention floor in Atlantic City. They had registered 63,000 new people and would only have two delegates. I think what happened to us in Atlantic City made people really aware that the, the government, government is, is not, not really real. with the people, for the people, by the people, but for a handful of folk. And the people don't have anything to say. With each new showdown for the civil rights movement, the tension mounted in the South and across the country. Dr. King and other civil rights leaders began to get threats on their lives. Martin Luther King is going to speak tonight down in Greenville, Mississippi. I understand so, and they're threats that they're going to kill him. Yeah. Now, I would think it'd be a good idea for you to talk to your man in Jackson and tell him that uh, we think that uh, it would be the better part of wisdom and the national interest that they work out some arrangement where somebody's in front of him, behind him, well, and I think it's a hell of a lot easier to watch a situation like that before it happens than it is to call out the Navy after that. That's right. Uh, don't you think I ought to also advise the governor what we plan to do on that? Yeah, yeah, I tell him that you ought to invite his people to join you. That's right. But if they don't join you, that you don't want to be looking for bodies after the fact. Right. I'm still convinced that the most significant step that the Negro can take at this hour is that short walk to the voting booth. We must gain political power, and we must come to the point of being able to participate in government. No longer must, be, must we be willing to be disenfranchised. We must say, give us the ballot. We are determined to have the ballot, and we are determined to have it now. And thank God. It's a little better here than in some other places. I know some other communities not too far from here that will put you in jail if you try to register and vote. I know some other communities not too far from here that will allow a brutal and inhuman shaft to beat you down to the ground and use cattle parts on you if you try to register and vote. I know some communities not too far from here that will use all kinds of conniving methods in order to keep Negroes from registering to vote. Let us march on ballot boxes. In fact, in 1965, only 2% of African Americans of voting age were registered to vote in Selma, Alabama. So on March 7th, John Lewis of SNCC and Hosea Williams of the Southern Christian Leadership Council set out to lead a 54-mile protest march from Selma to the state capitol in Montgomery. One of those marchers was a nine-year-old girl, Cheyenne Webb. Now, the Edmund Pettus Bridge sits above the downtown. You have to walk up it like it's a little hill. We couldn't see the other side. We couldn't see the troopers. 
I couldn't see all that much because I was so little. Then the people in front blocked my view. But when we got up there, on that high part and looked down, we saw them. And I remember a woman saying something like, oh my lord, or something. And I stepped out to the side for a second and I saw them. They were in a line. They looked like a blue picket fence stretched across the highway. There were others gathered behind that first line and to the side. And further back were some of Sheriff Clark's posse men and their horses. Traffic had been blocked. And at that point, I began to get a little uneasy about things. I think everyone did. People quit talking, and it was so quiet. Then all you could hear was the wind blowing and our footsteps on the concrete sidewalk. Well, we kept moving down the bridge, and I remember glancing at the water in the Alabama River, and it was yellow and looked cold. Hosea Williams said to John Lewis, See that water down there? I hope you can swim, because we're fixing to end up in it. The troopers could be seen more clearly now, and I guess I was 50 to 75 yards in front of them. They were wearing blue helmets, blue jackets, and they carry clubs in their hands. They had those gas mask pouches slung across their shoulders. The first part of the march line reached them, and then we all came to a stop. For a few seconds, we just kept standing. And then I heard this voice speaking over the bullhorn saying that this was an unlawful assembly for us to disperse and go back to church. I remember I held a woman's hand who was next to me and gripped it hard. I wasn't really scared at this point. Then I stepped out of ways and looked again and saw the troopers putting on their mask. That scared me. I had never faced the troopers before and nobody had ever put on gas masks during the downtown marches. But this one was different. We were out of the city limits and on a highway. William said something to the troopers asking if we could pray. And then I heard that voice again coming over the bullhorn telling us we had two minutes to disperse. So the next thing I know, it didn't seem like two minutes had gone by. The voice was saying, troopers advance and see that they are dispersed. Just all of a sudden, it was beginning to happen. I couldn't see for sure how it began, but just before it did, I took another look and saw the line of troopers moving towards us. The wind was whipping at their pants legs. All I knew, I heard the screaming and people were turning and I saw the first part of the line stumbling back towards us. And at that point, I was just off the bridge and on the side of the highway and they came running and some of them were crying out and somebody yelled, oh God, they're killing us. I think I just froze then. I remember looking towards the troopers and they were backing up, but some of them were standing over our people who had been knocked down or who had fallen. It seemed like just a few seconds went by and I heard a shout, gas, gas, and everybody started screaming again. And I looked and I saw the troopers charging us again and some of them were swinging their arms and throwing canisters of tear gas. And beyond them, I saw the horsemen starting to charge towards us. I tell you, I forgot about praying. I just turned and ran. And just as I was turning, the tear gas got me. And it burned my nose first, then it got to my eyes, and then I was blinded by the tears. So I began running and not seeing where I was going, and I remember being scared that I might fall off of a railing into the water. And I don't know if I was screaming or not, but everyone else was. And people were running and falling and ducking, and you could hear people scream and hear the whips swishing, and you hear them striking people. It seemed to take forever to get across the bridge, and it seemed that I was running uphill for an awfully long time. And I just knew then I was going to die that the horses were going to trample me. And all of a sudden, someone was grabbing me under the arms and lifting me up and then running. The horses went by and I kept waiting to get trampled on or hit, but they just went on by and I guess they were hitting at someone else. And I looked up and I saw it was Hosea Williams who had had me. And he was running, but we didn't seem to be moving. And I shouted at him, put me down, you can't run fast enough with me. But he held on until we were off the bridge, down on Broad Street, and then he let me go. And I didn't stop running until I got home. I could never understand the hatred some of the whites showed towards us. I was just a kid and they yelled at me. And yet we all prayed to the same God. I couldn't understand the hatred. I couldn't understand the segregation. What, what happened, happened in 1965 is history. history now. I know that. We have to go on. But I can never forget it. 
I never will. If I live to be 103, I'll still have my own commemoration on March the 7th. I think of it often, not just that day, but all the days of the movement here in Selma. I'm just so happy I could be a part of a thing that touched our souls. I'm so proud of the people that did something in 1965 that was truly amazing. We were just people, ordinary people, and we did it. Eight days after Bloody Sunday in Selma, President Johnson introduced the Voting Rights Act in Congress. On March 21st, with the protection of federal troops, the demonstrators concluded a peaceful march from Brown Chapel AME Church in Selma to the state capitol in Montgomery. In the summer of 1965, the Voting Rights Act was signed into law by President Lyndon Johnson. The legal mechanisms were now in place to enable African Americans to be full participants in the American system of democracy. But hundreds of years of bigotry and hatred did not disappear overnight. Divisions arose within the civil rights community. Martin Luther King had mounted a largely southern campaign. But as frustration and tension in northern cities began to escalate, many African Americans found that the words of Malcolm X related more to their experience of being black in America. Martin Luther King Jr. supported a strategy of nonviolent civil disobedience. Malcolm X used more controversial methods, and many people feared his message. One thing, we declare our right on this earth to be a man, to be a human being, to be respected as a human being, to be given the rights of a human being in this society, on this earth, in this day, which we intend to bring into existence by any means necessary. Sonia Sanchez, a civil rights worker in New York, describes the impact Malcolm X had on her thinking. People quite often want to make you believe that Malcolm was some terrible, terrible man who never smiled and who was always scowling and demanding something that was obscene almost. When I first saw Malcolm on television, he scared me also. My family said, turn off that television. That man is saying stuff you ain't supposed to hear. Instead of uh, our people continuing to let the Klan and these other racist elements intimidate us uh, with murder and, and uh, organized brutality, uh, if the Klan knows that we will retaliate, that we can retaliate and will retaliate and do unto them as they have been doing unto us, we feel that that in itself will be sufficient to hold them in check. And if the but you know when the sun comes in the window and you kind of jump up to get it, to close the blinds or pull down the shade, before you do that sun comes in? Well, before each time we turned off the television, a little sun came in. And you'd be walking someplace and it would resonate in the air what he said. And you would say, no, I can't listen to that because they say he's a racist, so don't listen. The first time I really listened to Malcolm was when Cor was doing a large demonstration. And Malcolm has sent out a directive to all of the civil rights organizations that you cannot have a demonstration in Harlem unless you invite me to speak. So in our office at 125th Street, we moaned and groaned and said, who is this man? Imagine that man saying such a thing. Who does he think he is? Of course we had to say yes. So we went to this big demonstration. Malcolm came over with his bodyguards, and I looked up and around, determined not to look at him, determined not to listen. But he started to talk, and I found myself more and more listening to him. When he came off stage, I walked up to him, and of course when I got to him, the bodyguards moved in front. He just pushed them away. I extended my hand and said, I like some of what you said. I didn't agree with all that you said, but I like some of what you said. And he looked at me, held my hand in a very gentle fashion and said, one day you will, sister, one day you will. And he smiled. After that, every time he was speaking in New York City, I was there. What he said to an audience is that we are enslaved. And everyone looked at first and said, who? We're enslaved? We're free. And he began to tell us and explain to us in a very historical fashion just what our enslavement was about. And Malcolm knew how to curse you up and make you love him at the same time for doing it. He knew how to, in a very real sense, open your eyes as to the kind of oppression that you were experiencing. 
On the one hand, he would say something in a very harsh fashion, and then on the other hand, he would kiss you and hug you. You see, what he said out loud is what African-American people have been saying forever behind closed doors. The reason why initially we cut off the televisions is that we were scared. What he did was he said, I will now wipe out fear for you. When he said it in a very strong fashion and this very manly fashion that says, I am not afraid to say what you've been thinking all these years. That's why we loved him. He said it out loud, not behind closed doors. He took on America for us. That's why we all loved him so very much. Because he made us feel holy. And he made us feel whole. He made us feel loved. And he made us feel that we were worth something finally on this planet Earth. Finally, we had some worth. In 1965, Malcolm X was assassinated in New York City. Three years later, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. The anger and frustration in the black community burst forth with fires and riots. However, an assassin's bullet could not stop the march toward equality. Slowly and quietly, more blacks were registering and voting, more blacks were being elected to public office in 1984. Reverend Jesse Jackson became the first African American to run a viable campaign for the presidency of the United States. And in 1984, Unita Blackwell, the mayor of Mayersville, Mississippi, and former delegate of the Freedom Democratic Party from 1964, spoke at the podium of the Democratic Convention. I was one of those people in 1964, Atlantic City, New Jersey, that came to the Democratic Party was asking, could we be a part of this democratic process from the state of Mississippi? 20 years has passed. It's been a long haul. But I have come from the outside to the inside and now to the podium. I felt tears because Fannie Lou Hamer should have been standing there. She was standing there in us, in me, in Jesse, in all of us, because in 1964 she testified. Cheney, Swerner, and Goodman died in my state, Mississippi, for the right for me to stand there. I was standing there for all who had died, for all who will live, and for all generations to come. Sit at the welcome table, oh Lordy. I'm gonna sit at the welcome table one of these days, hallelujah. I'm gonna sit at the welcome table. I'm gonna sit at the welcome table one of these days, one of these days. I'm gonna be a registered. Voter, oh Lord, I'm going to be a registered voter one of these days, hallelujah. I'm going to be a registered voter, I'm going to be a registered voter one of these days. I'm going to tell God on old Massey, oh Lordy, I'm gonna tell God on old Massey one of these days, hallelujah.